you guys. Uh, welcome to our fourth interview on the recruitment journeys interview series. Today we have a very interesting figure. Um, he's well known in the football circles in the United States. His name is um, Tabiso Boise Kumalo. Uh, he's currently the director and also head coach at uh, AFC Anaba and a, a former MLS player at DC United. Uh, a record holder in the NIA and uh, one of the few players that have actually made the, the great divide from the NIA to the NCAA Division One, and also been drafted. So he's pretty much played on every level of soccer in the United States, from, from high school up to professional. So we're very much uh, excited to have him here. And uh, thank you for giving us your time, boys and Kumal. Yeah, no, thank you for having me, my man. Yeah, it's, it's very, very exciting. Looking, looking at your profile, uh, it, it's very, very exciting to be interviewing someone like you. Uh, I think you actually get to give our viewers the full spectrum of how soccer is in the United States. And we, we are very, very much excited to, um, about that. So I just wanted to know, how did you get to the States, boys? Uh, so I got to the States uh, in 1996. There was a team from South Africa. It was a selected group of players from South Africa. Uh, a couple of kids from Soweto, uh, a couple of kids from like uh, El Dorado Park, different parts of South Africa in the townships. Um, we got to come to the States uh, to play in a tournament uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, the name of the tournament was called uh, Sister City. It was hosted by MasterCard at the time. Um, while we were playing the tournament, there was a, a South African pastor who, who lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, he knew some people in the area in in, uh, in, uh, in Lovo who were looking to host kids. So I was one of the kids who got picked to 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 stay back and you know get my education in America. I think that that, that must have been a very in interesting thing for you as well. But you had to make the the, the crossover only at 16 years old. Um, how was that transition for you? This is a guy from Soweto. Who they moved to the United States at, at, at 16. Uh, yeah. How was that transition for you? Oh, the transition was bad, man. I mean, I can tell you, like, uh, first of all, Soweto, I grew up with, uh, I'm, I'm surrounded by black people. Um, you know, everything I did around me was black. And then I moved to, to Kentucky, and uh, the school I went to, Bethlehem High School, it was an all white school. Um, it was hard for me to 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 get along because you know it, everything was just different man like i felt like i didn't fit in uh the communication the the food the the behavior of the people i mean they don't behave like the people i you know i'm used to um but with time i learned okay i have to act this way and also i also had a host family that was taking care of me so my mom susan and dave uh, they used to kind of help us and and show us what we needed to do. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I think me playing sports kind of helped me become uh, a better person because that's how I made friends. You know, I, I, I also ran track in high school. So by me running track and playing soccer, people be like, hey, you're good. So, you know, when you're a good player, everybody wants to be, <laughs> to be your friend. Uh -huh. um, and also another thing, back in... Uh, in Kentucky, I had messed up teeth, so I never used to talk a lot. So my teeth were all jacked up. Uh, so I was one of these guys when I talk, man, I gotta, you know, I talk like that. I gotta cover my mouth when I laugh. So I was a very shy guy. That's what I'm saying to you. Like it was very hard. Uh, but once I got the braces and I took the braces off, uh, I never stopped talking. That's why I talk so much now, man. <laughs> Okay, that, that, that's very, very interesting. I actually didn't know that you had braces one. Yeah, you see, look at the teeth, look. Yeah. Nah, <laughs> you, you have almost a perfect smile now. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I never used to smile, bro. Like, I never smiled at all. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, that, 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 that's very, very interesting. So, you say you did, uh, you did track in high school and then you also played soccer as well. What would you say yes, sir. were some of are actually some of the differences between uh, what you're used to or the sport that you used to do in South Africa and then all of a sudden you're, you're in the States where 
obviously a lot of things have changed in in, in South Africa. You guys have a stylish way of, of 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 playing soccer, and then when you come to the states now, it's a little bit type of a, of a different ball game. Uh, how was that transition for you, and what would you say were the main differences that surprised you when you get when you got to the states? Yeah, uh, first of all, man, when I moved to the state, I was a little bitty guy, so I was very small. Um, and I used to play as a forward. Um, yes, I was very fast. Uh, you know, like I said, I ran track. So I was, it was easy for me to, to go around guys. Uh, but the older I got and uh, the higher up the ranks I moved in, in my soccer game, I had to change the position uh, because uh, most of the defenders were, were bigger. You know, I'm playing against guys who are like six foot five. I'm only like five nine. So I cannot be playing as a striker because they just come right behind me and just kick me. And I could not, you know, deal with balls that were coming in the air. So I started switching my position to, to where I could be more successful. So I started playing as a winger. Uh, I could play right wing or left wing uh, because I was fast, like I said. So it was easy for me to, to attack the players because I was facing the players, you know. Um, and then from that position, I also went, I could play as a number 10. Um, yeah, that was a transition for me uh, uh, as a player. Okay, that, that's um, that's very interesting. So you pretty much blew up uh, the high school stages. Uh, you have a, a couple of records at Bethlehem, being one of the only players uh, who had who was go, going on a on a goal scoring spree. Uh, so it, it, it seems as if that you also had a very good um, high school career as well. So. I think people would like to know how is high school soccer in the United States. You, you often hear coaches then say, uh, like if, if 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 coaches are recruiting, they preferably want to play academy kids instead of um, having to, to 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 recruit from high school. How, how is high school soccer in the states? Yes. Yeah, so back in the day, high school soccer used to be the thing to do for for kids. Everybody wanted to be on the high school team. Uh, don't get me wrong, even now kids still want to, you know, represent where they're from, uh, their high school-wise. But back in those days, high school was the uh, only thing. There was no, I mean, there was competitive soccer, but there was no academies like there is now. Um, so, again, everybody wanted to play high school. Whereas if now it has changed, most of the players, they go play academy because they are top, top players. So... If you go to the academy, you cannot play high school soccer. You can either play academy and not play high school soccer. Or you can play high school soccer and then not play academy. You know, so, again, like I said, most of the kids now, they play academy. Whereas if with, uh, with the high school thing back then, for me, like, I didn't see no challenge. It was boring. It was, uh, <laughs> even now, even now when I go watch high school games, they're boring because now, the so-called good players are not in the high school game. They're playing academy. So if yeah, you want to yeah. watch good soccer yeah. games, you have to go to the academy. Whereas if back in the day, there'll be one or two schools that were very dominant. So if you were a coach, you could go watch those teams. And then that's how coaches recruited back then. But now, again, like I said, everybody goes to the academy. Um, competitive soccer, go to a lot of tournaments. That's how most of the coaches recruit now. Okay, so then uh, 2001, 2002 uh, was your freshman year at, at Lindsay Wilson, um, which is an, an NIA school. Uh, how did you end up at Lindsay Wilson? Uh, so first of all, Lindsay Wilson was like uh, an hour away from where I live. Um, and to be quite honest, I had a lot of offers from uh, like Division One schools. But because I had bad grades, uh, just like any other South African kid growing up, I always wanted to be a professional player. That was, that was my goal. Uh, I just saw myself being a professional player. But when I got to the States, things kind of changed. And uh, again, my host family told me like, hey, if you want to play college soccer, you have to take your grades seriously. Um, and another thing, going back to the transition you were talking about earlier, I struggle with a lot. Like at school, I struggle. I struggle. Um, I had to have a tutor to help me with like my homework because, you know, from South African education to the U.S. education is two different things. You know what uh -huh. I'm saying? So, so 
when I got all these offers, I couldn't go to these schools. So Lindsey Wilson was close by. Coach Ray Wells is like, hey, man, look, you can come to our school for about a year and then you can transfer. Uh, and then I was like, hey, you know what? That sounds like a good thing to do. So I ended up going to Lindsey. That's how I got to Lindsey. But uh, I, I spent two years in Lindsey and then I transferred to Coastal Carolina. So uh, you were the first, actually one of the only uh, freshmen in the NIA to be voted the, the NIA Player of the Year. And in that year, you were the first NIA, NIA freshman to be voted Player of the Year, scoring 23 goals. You, I think it was pretty much obvious that you were a king of the NIA in your freshman year. How was that experience? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say I was a king, man. Uh, uh, I was just a guy who, who liked the game. And uh, to be quite honest, uh, my mom used to get on me all the time. Even in high school, uh, I know you're talking about records and all these things. Uh, not to be cocky or anything, but I could have broke a lot more records. It's just that I'm a team player. I always mm -hmm. look to pass a ball. Um, those stats at Lindsay maybe could have been triple stats. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, when I got the play of the year, uh, it was a, I didn't feel anything different. To me, it was just like, hey, I've been doing this thing since I was little. Uh, it was not like, oh, wow, I finally made it. No, it was just like, okay, what is this? You know, I was not surprised. But I was disappointed the second year because I thought I was supposed to win it the second year. But, you know, some politics, things happen in the background where they said, ah, Boise won it last year. We got to give it to somebody else. So oh. just to tell you the truth, probably could have won it twice, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So you, 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 <laughs> then, you, then, made the, you, you then transferred to NCAA Division One, Coastal Carolina. Uh, yes, sir. How, how did that happen? We know a lot of athletes uh, face a, li a little bit of a trouble uh, having to transfer from NIA school to an NCAA Division One school. How did you make that transition possible? Oh, the transition, like I said, before I went to Lindsay, I already had a couple of offers from uh, a lot of Division I schools. So the only thing was just missing was my grades. Like I said, I didn't have good grades. So when I went to Lindsay, I had to make sure that I focused on my grades and uh, also focus on my soccer career. Um, I did well at school. Uh, I got a tutor, like I said earlier. Um, I got good grades. And uh, Coastal Carolina was one of the schools who were looking at me. Uh, Sean Docking, of course, came and he said, hey, man, we're going to give you a full ride uh, to come to, to Coastal Carolina. Now, mind you, even at Lindsay, I was a, at, at the full ride. Wow. But with me being a, a kid that always wanted to play professional at the time, uh, even now, I, I felt like by me going to the uh, Division One. Uh, competition, I'll get a better look to to be seen by professional teams. Whereas if in AI, NAIA, everybody's always like, nah, the league is too weak, blah, blah, blah. So that's why, and that's how I ended up at uh, Coastal Carolina. Okay, that's very interesting. I, I, was, I was actually listening to the names. It, 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 it seems like some of those guys have been in the game for a long time. Uh, guys like Gray Walls, guys like Sean Dawkins. I'm actually surprised that uh, they were recruiting you some from some 18 years ago. They're still there, Coastal Carolina. Yeah. yeah, no, they're still there, man. You gotta understand it's a soccer game, and I've helped those guys too to to send players to Lindsay to Coastal Carolina because you know that's what I do now. And I think also another thing. I mean, I'm not saying I'm the first one to open the doors to to for South African kids to go to Lindsay and Coastal. There have been guys before me that have done those things. So I just want to appreciate those guys. And now it's up to the other guys to open doors for other guys, you know, and just keep uh -huh. it going. Yeah, that's true. So, yes, and then how, how, how was it playing in the NCAA Division One? You, you ended up being uh, drafted by the Chicago Fire uh, in the 2005 um, MLS draft. So how was your career in the NCAA Division One? Uh, I thought it was good. Um, it, it was good. I also played with a couple of guys from your neck of the woods, man, from Zimbabwe. Uh -huh. We had uh, Joseph Nguenya, Mamba Chesoni, Itai Pondwa. Uh, I think Kabwe came. Joseph Kabwe also came, and he also went to Lindsay. But, you know, it was just uh, 
it was a bigger school, whereas if uh, Lindsay was a smaller school at the time, the biggest thing at Lindsay was soccer. So when I went to Coastal, it was just a different ball game. The school is big. People follow the, the, the sport there, uh, basketball, you name it, track. Like I said, I also ran track at, uh, at uh, Coastal too. Um, which oh. I didn't like doing, but I did it because <laughs> <laughs> because I was on a scholarship too, you know, so it, it was a good thing. Um, but yeah, man, that's it. So you then got drafted uh, by the Chicago Fire in the 2005 MLS draft. So I, I, pretty, I pretty much think this is the time where you then say, you know what, I've always wanted to be a professional and this is an opportunity for me to, to then make that transition to realizing my dreams. Yes. Um, so what then happened then, then during, during that draft now? And, and to be quite honest, I think I kind of changed, man, when I moved to Coastal. Uh, I took school more seriously because uh, I graduated from Coastal Carolina. That's where I got my, uh, my bachelor's degree. Uh, I got more into the education side of things. Um, and another thing that happened when I was at Coastal and Lindsay, I don't know if you know this, but there are summer teams that we play in. At the time, they were called like the PDL. Uh -huh. So what we do is I'll play for the PDL team. So I used to play for the Chicago Fire Reserve PDL team at the time. So I used to train with the first team. So that's how I got seen by uh, Chicago Fires, the, the first team. And that's how I got drafted. Okay, but then apparently you didn't then play for them. You then moved on to, to play in the U.S. or what, yes. what happened then? Oh, so what happened then? <laughs> so I went, when I was at Chicago, uh, it, it was a tough situation because I went there I, and I got cut, to be quite honest. They released me uh, in Chicago and I was very disappointed because, you know, another thing, uh, about the game is when I was playing for Chicago Fire, the reserve, I was playing free. Like, you know, I was just playing like a kid again, like a kid from Soweto, not worried about things. Not. And then when I, they drafted me and I started training with them, like I'm one of their players. There was too many rules, too many, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. So that kind of took me away from what I was used to doing. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then the coaches are, hey man, you're not the same guy that we used to see a year ago, you know, just playing free. And I, I told him, I was like, hey man, at the time I was not free. I didn't have a contract. I didn't have nothing. Now you guys are telling me I'm making a wrong move when I'm, I've been playing like this the whole time. You know what I'm saying? It's just that now I'm a professional. So I have to play a certain way. So I had to kind of disagree with that. But uh, another thing that happened is there was two of us uh, on a foreign spot. So they picked one kid and I, they let me go. So that's what happened there. And I moved on and then I moved there and I played for Charleston Badry in, uh, in South Carolina. Now, when I got to Charleston Badry, uh, I played for free, man, to be quite honest, because when I went there, my visa had expired. Uh, my visa expired. So when I got to Charleston Badry, they already signed all the players. And, uh, you know, the coaches are, hey, man, we can only get you housing and, and uh, stipend. Uh, so I think I was making like, man, not even more than 500 bucks. So I was making like grocery money, you know, uh -huh. like something to eat. And uh, that was that. So after a year, I was like, man, I don't know if I could do this, you know. And because I was also playing and there's guys on the team who were making a lot more money and I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, nah, man, I need to make money. So I just left. I went to another team right down the, the road uh, in North Carolina. Guess what happened? Same story. I get there. The coach is like, hey, man, we already got the players. <laughs> we don't have the money. And I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do with myself? So I, I ended up playing there for a year. Same story. Got me housing, not making money. And I was like, man, this is... So I finally called and I was like, you know what? F this, man. I'm going back home. So I went back to South Africa. Yeah, so I saw you, I got, you then went back to yeah. South Africa where you then played in a, a ABC Patches Motepa League. Why it's now called ABC Patches Motepa League. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, at the time it was called Vodacom. Vodacom. Uh -huh. Yes. So how was then that transition? You're back in South Africa. A lot of things obviously have changed, and and probably you also have changed as a person as well. Uh, how was how was that now for you? No, actually, it was good, man, because I went back to uh, to one of my old coaches, uh, Farouk Khan. He's got like a big name in South Africa. He's got a academy. And at the time when I went back, he just started the academy. It's called uh, Stars of Africa. Um, I went there and I trained and I just focused on my training uh, just to become a better player. And at the time, too, I also got uh, uh, started thinking about getting into coaching because I was like, you know, I don't want to play soccer anymore. I need to start thinking uh, about other things. Um, so... Being in South Africa, it was good because I was with family, I was with friends, but at times it was hard because I was not making money. I was struggling to make money. Um, you know, I was playing for free again uh, with the Stars of Africa because the team didn't have money. But we were getting like good training, good players, because some of those players now, guess what? They're making money, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, which is a good thing. Uh, but for me, when I was in South Africa and at the start, at the Stars of Africa, I felt more like I was a role model to the younger younger kids because they were always ask me like, hey, what is it like in the States? What is this like? What is that like? And I would always tell them and, uh, and I always push the school thing. I always told them, hey, man, you guys got to go to school, man, because this soccer thing, you never know. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Not everybody's going to play for Real Madrid. Not everybody's going to play for Chiefs and Pirates, you know. Some other kids are just going to end up where they are. So you got to have options as a person. You cannot just look at one option and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. That's it. No, you got to have other things in case that, that thing you depending on doesn't work. Um, so while I was in South Africa, I kept sending out my CV because I was like, hey, man, I got to get a job. So my CV looked good enough. There was an American company uh, in South Africa that were looking – for someone who can start, like, uh, there was a program, actually, it's called, uh, uh, what's it called? Football Dreams. So, Football oh, Dreams, wow. yeah, it was a, they, they, we started it in South Africa, where we get, like, three players from South Africa, Ghana, and Nigeria, and the whole thing about it was they were looking to get 21 players to send them to Qatar at the academy. So, I was part of that. And then while that was going on, that's how I started creating my own foundation in my head. I was like, man, I can do the same thing because the guy who came and did it was some guy from Barcelona. And I was like, man, we live in South Africa. I'm South African. Why can't I do the same thing? Mm -hmm. So I just started the, the foundation, me and two of my boys. Uh, of course, you know, we started it like, <laughs> okay, what are we doing? Yeah, because we end up making <laughs> money on the foundation. And we just started a small, just started helping out. And uh, that's how South Africa was when I moved back. And then uh, also another thing, I used to send emails to my people in the U.S. And one of my buddies, Jason Cutney, uh, you know, he sent me an email. He's like, hey, man, I'm working with this club. Would you like to come back uh, uh, and play for the club, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, man, I'm interested. So what he did was he got me a visa, bam, went back to the States. So that that's that was very very interesting. I actually didn't know that uh, Um Club uh, was actually has its roots originally in South Africa at, at a time where you had gone back to connect back with the people as well. Um, so your family now they were thinking boys is back. And then they they then hear yeah, boys is going back. <laughs> uh, how do they take it now? Not having you again. Nah, to be quite honest, man, my family's good. My mom, I mean, we have an open relationship. She, you know, growing up, she always told me, hey, do what makes you happy. Uh, follow your heart. So, you know, even before I came to the U.S. the first time, she asked me, hey, what do you want to do? You want to stay here or you want to go back? I mean, you want to go to the U.S. for this opportunity? Uh, and I told her I want to go back. And then she supported me. So if, if, if if I if I didn't have that support, I think I would have been a little bit hesitant to 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 come to the states. But my mom was like, "Hey man, go for it," and that's how I am now. Like I'm a go go guy. Anyway, I can go anywhere in the world, man. And 
you know, it's easy for me now. Yeah, it's true. So you, we, we, we usually get parents who were sort of kind of scared to have their kids go over to, to start off a whole, a whole new life um, in the States or wherever they need to be. Maybe at times they're a little bit scared to lose their kids and everything. What would you, or what sort of advice would you give to people who, who then have to ask this question? Do I send out my 16-year-olds to chase their dream? Yeah, first of all, man, and this is what a lot of people do. You got to do research, you know. If you know your kid is going, for example, I deal with this all the time. If I know a kid is moving to the States and I'm in South Africa, I've never left South Africa. Uh, and you also got to understand, I'm going to back up a little bit. Back then, the emails, the 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 the, the phones were, was not, you know, in my mom's face like that. We only had a landline phone. You know, if you wanted to reach me, you got to call the house and you'll talk to my mom. Um, now, with that being said, it was easy for my mom to understand because we also had a South African guy who was speaking our language to kind of be the guy in the middle to translate, hey, this is what's going on. Boys, he's going to go to the U.S., study, come back, or boys, he's going to go there, stay. And to my mom's ears, it sounded good. Um, so my advice to people would be, if you're going to send somebody anywhere, you got to make sure you do research. Don't just send someone there and be like, oh, okay, they'll be fine. No, you got to make sure you do research. You got to make sure you, you record everything that you're talking about with these people in whatever country. So you have proof of what you guys are talking about. I mean, I'm sure you know, even with the scholarships, coaches will say, hey, we'll give you guys a full ride scholarship. And... Somebody in South Africa is thinking of it as like, okay, I don't have to pay anything. But the funny thing is once you come here, you got to pay for like books, you got to pay for your housing. And so these things, you must do research. And, and the biggest thing with a lot of people is this, especially people back home, they're scared to ask questions. Never be scared to ask questions, man. If you don't know, you don't know. So if you thought I know, you must ask, you know. So, and I always tell people, and we had a couple of those, uh, girls uh, that we were trying to bring here with our foundation, they were scared. And because the mom or the parents, they never did the research. They're just scared listening to somebody talking, oh, it's like this in the U.S., it's like that. Then they go, oh, okay, I don't want my kid going there. And, of course, they watch TV and they're like, no, I don't want that happening to my kid. But for me, do research, find out more information, ask people, there's South Africans everywhere in the world. Find someone who's from South Africa, who understands the culture, just like you, you're sending guys from Zimbabwe. There's one guy from Zimbabwe who played soccer here. They understand it. So find that guy, and now it's easy. Social media, everybody's on social media. That's how you find people like that, and they can help. Yeah, that's true. I think, I think it's also very important when, when you're trying to send people to, to, to have that background knowledge of what, what you're trying to send them to. But at, at, at times you don't necessarily get what you've been told you, you, you're going to get as well. So, yeah, yeah so I think it's, it's very, 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 very true that you have to do your research. So now you're back in the States and you're now playing for Kuzbek. Uh, how was that for you now? You, you, you're in South Africa, you're, not, you're now back in the States. And then you, I think at, the, at this point in time, you're also thinking, I can also go, I can, I can, I can still go pro. Yeah, I know. I mean, even the Pittsburgh team was a pro team. It was a USL team, which was like second division at the time. Um, so when I was there, I mean, like I said, one of my friends, Jason Cutney, he's the guy who got me there. It was good, man, because I, I worked my butt off simply because I was like, man, I, I just struggled because I lived in South Africa for a year. And I was like, man, I just struggled for a year without it even making a cent. So coming back to the state, was kind of like a motivation, it's like, hey man, I have to prove myself, you know, I gotta, I gotta work. If, if I worked a hundred percent last time, I gotta work a thousand percent this time. So I worked extra hard. I kept pushing at, at practice. And uh, six months later, DC United call, you know, and that's how I got to DC. Now the story with DC is the guy, the GM used to work for Pittsburgh. So he moved to D.C. and then when he got there, and I did well also at Pittsburgh, 
And when I moved to DC, uh, I get there and then all these guys, they asking me, hey, where have you been? We've been looking for you. Not knowing that I was back in South Africa and a lot of teams were looking for me. But, you know, back in those days, man, it was not like now it's easy to just look somebody up and find them. Mm -hmm. I just went back to South Africa and I didn't tell anybody. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Inter <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's yeah. very, very, very interesting. So yeah, at, D at DC United, um, uh, as I was doing my research now, I, I saw in 2008, you, you had your debut for DC United. You scored against David Beckham. Uh, David Beckham led LA, LA Galaxy. How was that feeling for you now? We, you're definitely now in the MLS and you, you, you have scored your first goal for, for DC United. Yeah, again, man, like I said, there was no, <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm, I'm a different type of guy. There was no feeling like, oh, wow, I'm in the MLS. No, like I said before, I grew up doing this thing, you know, it's just that when I did it back in South Africa, I was doing it on the streets with just my friends. Now I'm doing it and people are watching it on TV and there's fans and everybody's dressed the same. And to me, it was just like, this is just the same. Um, but at the, at the same time, when people talk about it, that's when I kind of realized like, oh shoot, man, <laughs> what I did was kind of nice. But me personally, I'm just like, ah, it was just a soccer game, nothing, nothing special. Um, what you see and what you know about me, it's, this is who I am, man. Nothing changes. So wait till I die, you know? So, um, but playing in that game, it, it was good. Um, just to be there with those guys. And, uh, of course we played against Beckham, Landon Donovan. It was just good because these are the guys you see on TV and now you finally there with them. And it was just like, ah, it's the same. The same, and I know people don't like to hear me talk like that. They think I'm gonna be like, oh man, it was great. It was nah, it was just I was in LA, you know. Then that's it, nothing special. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's very interesting on, on on how you take it. Um, I think you you being a little bit on 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 the humble side as well. But for for kids who are definitely in Africa. Uh, only having ahead of David Beckham, um, only ahead of London Donovan, and, and and at times it's hard to dream. I remember last year we had a couple of kids that we were trying to help, but then the society was telling them that their dreams were too much to reach for. You know, people then tell you, you know what? Uh, stop selling these dreams to kids. At least, yeah. if you want to motivate them, sell them a dream of playing in South Africa. Don't tell them of going to play overseas when it's clearly impossible. So I think for someone who's lived it, someone who's experienced it, you then feel, okay, um, this is me. This is who I am. But then there are then kids down here who then look at you and say, wow, I want to be like boys. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's I want true. to be <laughs> Yeah, but like, no, man, like even with me growing up as a kid, I always saw myself somewhere overseas. I didn't know it was going to be in the States or it was going to be Europe. I just had a dream when I was little. Like, you know, these things you think about it as a kid, but you don't know what you're thinking about. You're just like, I'm not here in South Africa. I'm somewhere else. And you see yourself in that place. Then it's like a normal thing to you because you see yourself there. So when I got to the States, of course, it was different, but when I, when I, as, I, as I'm older now and I sit back and I think, I was like, dude, I used to think about this thing. Like, I, I used to think about this thing because when I was a kid, that's all I thought about, playing overseas and, and, and playing soccer and becoming somebody in life. Um, but what I would tell kids is every kid has the right to dream, man. You, you got to dream big. You cannot dream small. You cannot dream, like you said, parents are telling the kids to dream about PSL. No, dream about freaking playing for Barcelona, Real Madrid. You know, those are the dreams kids want to... Because another thing is, those kids see those guys, I mean, everywhere. You know, social media there, social media that. Don't get me wrong. Same thing with our African players. They see them. But someone who's way out there to reach... 
it's uh it, it's like a, a harder goal to get to so that's why some of the parents are like hey maybe look up to somebody who's close to you but the funny thing sometimes is the people who are close to you don't really uh come around to give these kids hope and that's why like with us our foundation that's what we try to do like you know get some of these guys that play pro and I always tell them, you got to do things while you're still playing. You cannot do things when you're not playing because nobody cares now. You know, yeah. when you're playing and you, you, you're in front of people, you see the people see you every day, that's when you got to do things. Like, do your foundations, charities, all that stuff. And then post about it, talk about it. Go hang out with these kids, take pictures, you know, do those things now while you're still playing because – after you're done playing, and that's what everybody does. After you're done playing, you go back, you try to do things. Nobody cares now because nobody knows who you are now. Yeah, you know, true. so, uh. yeah. So, so do things. I mean, that's a different message to, 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 and also to the players if they get to that level. Do things while you're still playing, not when you're done playing. So, uh, basically what would you say, a lot of people ask, what's the secret to your, to your success? So, what would you say was the main motivating factor or what would you say was the secret to your success as, as an athlete and, and, and also as a student throughout your career? What was that secret to your success? What made Boise click? Ah, dude, like, I, I mean, again, I come from nothing. So when you come from nothing, you got to work extra hard. You got to work 10 times better than everybody. So, and with all that said too, I also had good support from my mom, my dad in South Africa, and my brother and sister, and my friends in South Africa. So now when I got to the States, uh, my host mom, Dave and Susan, the support was extra, extra support. So you don't want to disappoint those people. And I'll give you two scenarios. When I was in South Africa playing soccer, my mom and dad never see me play soccer. You understand? Like, I'll play like two minutes away. They'll never come to a game. Because why? They're busy working, and that's the way it is in South Africa. They're working, they got to make money, I got to come eat, you know, things like that. And then when I moved to, to the U.S., I mean, I'll tell you, man, I'll have a game eight hours ago. Guess what? My host mom and dad will drive with me to the game. You know, like that support that you get, and you don't want to let people down. You want to keep pushing. And because you can tell by looking at them that uh, – they are proud of you. When they even when they talk to other people about you, like, oh man, I didn't know this guy is this good. Especially my mom in South Africa, she still hasn't seen me play till today. But <laughs> she hears people talk about it, and she's like, oh yeah, yeah, my son, and this and that. But with me, it's all about hard work, and you also gotta believe in yourself, man. You know, and, and people are gonna say things, negative things. You have to believe in yourself and keep pushing forward. And also the people that you surround yourself with, uh, people that believe in me, and also people that I believe in them. So when they tell me things, I can take it in a good way, not in a bad way. So if I say, hey, Philip, man, I think you messed up there, you should be like, oh, okay, man, I see what you mean, blah, blah, blah. Don't get mad and then don't talk to the person. So um, I think it's good to surround yourself with people like that. And I said earlier, I'll give you two scenarios with my mom in South Africa where the support, you know, like I'll have a game two, three minutes away. They'll never come watch me play. But they'll always hear people in the neighborhood, hey, your son is good at this, your son is good at that. And in my mom's face, I could see it. She was excited. But it's just that she didn't have enough time to, to watch me play. But now, move forward, when I came to the States, it's a different kind of support. Like, you know, if I have a game five hours away, my mom and dad, Susan and Dave, we all go to the games. You know, eight hours away, they come to the games, college games, high school games. Everything I did, they came to. And, like, for me, as a kid, I also got lost because I was like, hey, man, my real parents never supported me. <laughs> These people who don't even know me, they supported me. What's going on here? <laughs> but as you get older... As you get older, then you start to understand the cultures. Cultures are different. You know, in South Africa, even now, I see my, my brother and my sister, they have kids. They don't watch what they do. It's like how they do things. But my job is to teach them, like, hey, you got to support your kid because your kid, you might not know what your kid can do. You got to support them so they believe in themselves. And that by doing that, that builds confidence in the kid. 
And I think my confidence kind of built more once I got to the U.S. Because, again, going to games with my parents in a car, we're talking about the game and we're talking about a lot of things. So you see how much people care about what you do. Uh, um, so, yeah, that's what I'll say about that, man. And, I mean, I can keep going on and going on about it. Yeah, it's actually interesting what you just said. Um, it's actually true. Our African parents at times really do pitch up for any events for their kids, which is something that uh, might actually help the kid if, they, if they're supporting uh, them more. So I think yes. it's true. Uh, kids definitely need that support where you have your parents come watch you play. At times, even them watching you play might also motivate them to do more for you in terms of when they see how good you are, it becomes easy for them to support them. Yes, so, no, 100%. Yeah, so now looking at uh, Umslaba, um, you obviously started in way back 2008, well, you're in South Africa. What is Umslaba yes. all about? Uh, Umslaba, man, it's a non-profit organization. Uh, we started again with me and uh, Cosmos and KB, two of my guys. Um, the foundation, the things that you just talked about now, just because you mentioned it, I have to bring it up about the parents supporting their kids, uh, little things like that. That's what our foundation is about. We host tournaments, we invite parents to come support their kids. It doesn't have to be your parents, but somebody from your, a, a family member, they can come support you. But what the foundation does is uh, we work off uh, uh, donations. So what I'll do is I'll get stuff in the US and I'll send it back to South Africa, stuff like the soccer boots, your balls, pretty much soccer equipment. And uh, we spread it out through Soweto. And that's how we started. And also helping uh, kids from South Africa come to the U.S., which is the number one goal. Like, that's what we're all about, helping kids from South Africa to come to the U.S. for education reasons. Um, now, the foundation has grown that we're not only just helping kids from South Africa, we're helping kids from all over. Um, and trust me, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something that we as an organization believe in. I mean, education is very important. Uh, just like I said earlier, not every kid is going to play for Barcelona, Chiefs, Pirates. We also need to have doctors, lawyers. Um, now that I said a doctor, I forgot to tell you another thing. So when we came to the States, the one of the guys I came with, okay, um, he played with us on the same team and uh, we lived in the same house. So there was three of us. And ever since we came to the States, his goal was, hey, you know what? I want to be a doctor. He didn't really care about soccer. He was a good soccer player. Don't get me wrong. He plays soccer to pay for his education. You know, whereas if me, I was like, man, all I want to do is play professional, blah, blah, blah. With him, he was just like, hey, man, I just want to be a doctor. So guess what? The guy's a doctor right now in South Africa. So with people like that, again, surrounding yourself with good people, that's what we're about, helping our own people to become better people, you know? Yeah, and how and do you again, guys recruit? How do you guys get these players to, 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 to be a part of Umflava? So, I mean, people, when we started it, uh, I'll just mention one kid we helped out, Lindo. So what we'll do, we'll find host families for the kids uh, to, to, to come live with in the U.S. because it's very hard if you don't know the American system, and I've seen it. So, and I'll also tell you about when kids come to the U.S. early. It's good for them because then they understand the system, they understand about the NAIA, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. they understand all of that. And they also understand the American schooling system, you know? So it becomes an easy transition for them because they're already here. Whereas if you bring a kid from Africa, you bring them all the way here, it's a different setup. You know, even if the guy is 19, if you just throw the guy in the dorms at a college somewhere in Texas, he doesn't know nobody. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know who to talk to. So our foundation, we try to help kids. We find them uh, host families. Now, with that being said, some of the kids, it's, uh, 
bad because they become American, Americanized. They forget, they forget that, hey, I'm here to, to, to study and push this soccer thing. And yes, if I'm good enough, I'll go pro. But, you know, if I'm not, then I can use my education. So that's what the foundation does, man. I mean, we do a lot of stuff, man. So it just keeps going and going and the foundation is growing and growing. So which is a good thing depending on where we started, <laughs> you know, yeah, in 2007. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's very interesting. I was also looking at, um, at, at your social media, also looking at your website. And uh, I think you guys have done pretty well, especially with the number of some of the guys that you, you've brought in from, from, from South Africa. And then they, yeah. they're now playing at very good levels in the United States as well. Uh, as you okay. rightly recently mentioned, uh, Lindo. Uh, Lindo Mfeka, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. So Lindo, yeah, he's one of our guys. I mean, there's other guys like uh, Lebo Muloto. He's at uh, was he at now Tulsa. There's other guys who just came. They're just guys who did not make it to the pro ranks, but uh, they are guys who are still doing well in school. And uh, some of these guys, you know, they going back and giving back to their own communities uh, through the foundation you know mm -hmm. which is which is a good thing because i like to see guys do that because some of the guys come from rural areas you know so you gotta support where you're from and 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 help the next generation and you know just to give them hope so most of the guys that we work with that's another thing that we tell them they i mean i don't say you have to do it i'm just saying hey man I think you just need to do a little something in the community, whether it's throwing a tournament or whether it's just getting kids together, give them balls, especially in Christmas, give them T-shirts, just to give them hope and know that there's people like you in our neighborhood who will still come back and, and try to give back because a lot of guys don't do that stuff, man. I know we, we all don't have a million dollars sitting in a, in, a, in a bank account, but you know, just imagine just you giving a pair of boots to someone who does not have boots. You can change your life. That's, that, that, that's very true. I, I think it's very commendable what you guys are doing with Umflava. Uh, you're definitely changing lives. You're definitely opening doors for, for, for some of those kids. Now you're at uh, RFC and uh, you You've been there for pretty much uh, some time now. You, you're into the coaching ranks now. I was, I was coaching now and I was post-life after, after your soccer career? Yeah, to be quite honest, man, a lot of people ask me, when did I start coaching? Uh, when, when I moved to the States, I started coaching because my host dad used to coach us. So when he coached us, he did not know how to explain certain things or how to run a drill or how to do a move. So I'll be the guy like, hey, this is how you do this. So that's how I got into coaching. Um, and then, of course, right after my soccer career, uh, I started focusing more on getting my uh, coaching education um, in the U.S., of course, like my coaching licenses. So that's what I got. Uh, and yes, right now I'm working with AFC and ABBA. I'm working on both sides. I'm working with the men and the women. So, so for me, it, it, it's a good thing because I'm a type of guy who likes to learn. Believe it or not, I never used to like learning. But now I'm all about learning, man. That's all I do is learn, 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 read, read, read. That's mm -hmm. my new passion. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I, I, I recall you saying at some point in time when you were in high school, all you wanted to do was to play soccer. And then yes, it changed from playing soccer and then you're, not, you're, you're now a, a student as well. Oh. Yeah, no. I mean, if, as a coach, you also got to learn, right? You can just say, hey, I played, I know everything. No, you got to learn because the, the game changes. It's more than soccer, man. Every day the game changes. Every day there's a new technology. Every day there's a new player who does something people haven't seen and everybody's like, oh, how is he doing that? So with me too as a coach, I also have to teach myself, learn certain things, learn from others, you know, and that's how I'm going to grow as a, as a human being and as a coach. Yeah, that's very true. So basically now we have that advantage the way we, we're talking with you as a coach now. Uh, and then uh, there are a lot of people who think, you know what, I want to go and play in the United States. Um, I want to go and play pro in the United States. 
what would you say or how do you guys recruit at, at, at the pro stages what what sort of qualities are you looking at um when you when you're trying to get players uh first of all uh to recruit in africa is difficult uh because uh some of the videos you know when, when you send uh uh a video from africa to the states you don't really know the level whereas if for me i kind of understand the level from different parts of africa so somewhere i'm just speaking about a, a, an american coach if he sees a video of a kid from africa he's probably like what level is this is this pro what is this he doesn't have an understanding so what we do of course is look at the kid's video uh to see how good the kid is and now, of course, you also do it. You have a, a video clip of a kid where you can see what position he's playing, what number he is, what's his number, and uh, you get him to say hello, blah, blah, blah. So those are the things we look for. We look for videos. But for me, let me just speak about me. First of all, before even the video, I want to know if a person is a good person. Oh. You understand what I'm saying? I want to know if... Hey, I can talk to Philip and have a good conversation with them. The reason I like to do that because I want to know your behavior. You know, as much as we can say, hey, how do we bring players here? You can look at the video, bring the kid, the kid comes here, but you find that his personality doesn't match his playing. Yes, he could be a good player, but he can have a messed up personality. Then me and that guy cannot get along. You know what I'm saying? So it's best if he just goes back. So... Personality for me is number one. Um, for of course, like if I'm looking at the player and I'm gonna look at speed uh, of the player. And when I say speed, I'm not talking about how fast the guy is. Like, oh, he's running fast. You know, speed of the game, the way he sees the game, how he thinks. You know, if he's a defender, if he can anticipate the pass. You know, speed of the game, things like that. And then I'm also thinking about intelligence. How good is this player? You know, does he have the game IQ? Does he understand the game? You know? So if he doesn't understand the game, there's no way he's going to make it. But if it's somebody you can see, and there's somebody that you see, he's got something that you can work with on an intelligent level, because you can teach those things as a coach. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, you can teach those. And like the other one, the next one will be technique, of course. So technique, again, is something that you can teach. Uh, make sure that the kid have a good technique. And my job as a coach is to help the kid become better and help him have a good, good technique. So the way I would put it, we call it the tips. So T is for technique, I is for intelligent, P, personality, uh, S, speed. So you got to have those four things for, for me to... To, to, to look at you um, and then we take it from there and I also like to know where the player is from in Africa how he, the player grew up and if the parents are involved we have to know these things you know because some kids come here you don't know if he has a family or not you don't know but mm. we have to know these things you know and I like to also get the family members included even if it's a pro contract I like to get the family members included whether it's a mom or dad so they know what their kid is doing so they could be proud of their kid you know yeah yeah that's that's very interesting um especially when you, you when you mentioned the uh, the behavior of of the athlete a lot of athletes um tend to ignore that side of uh, of them being of of them being people uh, at times you know but yes. just because you're simply good in soccer doesn't give you the leeway to go about going your life any way you want. You also have to have that discipline as a, as a player. You also have to have that respect for boundaries, respect for a lot of things. So I think it's very interesting uh, to find out that you guys are also looking at that when, when you're looking at players. Yeah, no, I mean, like, we, we, we look at that. And I'll give you a, a, a story with uh, one of the kids we had uh, from Kenya, Stanley Okumu, uh, he, 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 he's one of the guys, I could say the way he played when he came to us, he was playing like a pro. And the reason I'm saying this to you is when people wanna be pros, they think you become a pro when you sign a contract. 
you gotta live like a pro before you sign a contract. You understand what I'm saying? Not when they sign you, now you're like, oh, I'm gonna be a pro. I'm gonna stop doing this, I'm gonna stop doing this, now I'm gonna live this way. You gotta live like that every day. So once you get to that level of being a pro, it's just the easy transition. You're like, oh, like I'm telling you about me. Like I was just like, ah, what is this? I've been here before, it's just that it's a bigger stage. So going back to this Stanley Okumu guy, the guy in practice, we playing little Rondo. He's playing like he's playing 11 v 11. He's kicking the crap out of people. You know, when you, he's a defender, that's the way he plays. And don't get me wrong, maybe there's a couple of times where he could have backed off a bit, but he'll look at you in the face. He's like, hey man, if you don't want to be touched, go play tennis. Because every day the guy came and worked and you could see it. And within our whole group, you could, if I was to pick one guy who's going to go to the next level, it's that guy. Why? Because the way he trained, the way he ate. I remember taking a guy out to eat, you know, American food. And he's like, hey, man, this is not healthy for me. I need healthy food. And I'm like, dude, this is like, you know, the best restaurant, man. What are you talking about? But to him, he's like, no, nah, I don't eat this food. So we had to go get him a salad, blah, 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 all that stuff. He ate it. But you could see the mentality, you know, the way he sees it. And he wanted to be a pro a long time ago. Guess where the guy is? The guy's played in the African Cup of Nation for Kenya. The guy is playing in Sweden now. He was a pro before he became a pro. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. That's very true. That's very interesting. So you, you have worked with quite a number of kids um, who have also gone on to, to become professionals as well. I think it is very interesting when we get to, to learn that you can actually pinpoint someone not because of how talented they were, but you can did pinpoint him because of his personality and the type of person uh, that he was that eventually led him to be a professional soccer player as well. Yes. That, that, that's very, very, very interesting. So now I think we would like to know what has been your highs in, in your career as a, as, a, as a soccer player and also as a coach. Uh, soccer career, like the, the soccer thing to me, man, um, I, I really don't have a highlight and I know people say, Hey, cause you play pro my, I'm not going to say both of the things that you said, my, my, my biggest highlight of my career is getting my college degree, man. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because in my first, in the whole Kumalo clan or Kumalo family, I'm the first one to, to get a degree and guess what? And I'm the guy who's pushing other people to get degrees. So to me, the soccer side of things, ah, nah, because then it's just me being me. But going to school, getting my education, I would have never thought that coming. A kid from Soweto getting his own, you know, a degree yeah. and graduating from the university, nah, I would have never seen that coming. So that's like the biggest thing, man, in, in my career. Yeah, that's that's very impressive, very inspiring. Uh, what uh, what would you then say um, as a word of inspiration to the kids? But the main purpose of this show is we we are trying to get kids to to be inspired uh, on what can happen should you take your education seriously, as long as uh, you're also playing soccer. But then your education can open doors for you as well. What would you say as as, as a word of inspiration to kids who are in a back home in Africa? in regards to them wanting to be pros and also taking the education seriously as well? Uh, first thing I'll say, man, they're going to take education very seriously. And the reason I'm saying this is because you as a player, you must be able to also look at your contract and understand what's going on in the contract. Because a lot of African players have been screwed in the past not knowing what's written on the contract. So by having your education, <laughs> by having your education and also being a good athlete who wants to go pro, you must know how to read a contract. You also must know how much you have in a bank account. You also must know how much you're going to get. You know, you need to have an education in anything you do. So for me, education is number one. You know, whether you go to school or college, and the funny thing now is you can go to, you can be a professional player and still go to school, uh -huh. you know, cause you only train, you only train twice a day. I mean, once or twice a day, you can take classes online 
and still study for about three hours. You know, you have all kinds of time to do all kinds of things. And like now, uh, the guy level, the guy that I work with, uh, I told him this five years ago. I'm like, hey, dude, you got to start thinking about life after soccer because you looking at it, you have four or five years. You got to start thinking about the next thing. And that's another thing about being a professional player. What are you going to do if you don't become a professional player without education? You have to think that way. So what I would say is have education. Yes, soccer is number one, but use soccer as